Welcome to uh, today's uh, combined uh, INCF and uh, Society for Physiology seminar series. So today we are we are really happy to have Professor Hagai Bergman here. He's from he's professor in physiology uh, at the Hebrew University, and he's a really good representative both for physiology but also for neuroinformatics. He, he has. Uh, wide toolbox, uh, which he uses. He uses uh, multi-electrode uh, in vivo recordings and uh, data analysis of, of these parallel spike planes, and it's a lot of data, I'm afraid. And he's also doing simulations and modeling, and he has also developed disease models for Parkinson's disease in my case. So, uh, earlier in, in life, in uh, late 80s and beginning of the 90s, he was a postdoc first with Moshe Avelos and then M Malon de Long, which both are famous. And I think today Haggai is most well known for having uh, figured out that it is the uh, subthalamic nucleus that you can, if you inhibit that, you can ameliorate the Parkinson's disease symptoms. So I think this is sort of something that most people know. That was actually a science publication that has been cited, I don't, I don't know how many times, but a lot of times. Mo mo more than 1,000. Yeah, it's really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We've stopped counting the 1,000. Good, good goal to, to, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so please go ahead. Thank and you. Tell us your story. Thank you, Jeanette. The, thank you, Stan and uh, Gilly and uh, everybody else for coming in, in the noon to, to hear me. I feel a little bit too equipped, but I'll try to survive. Uh, uh, I, I'll try to speak about the computational physiology of the basal ganglia. That is, what do the basal ganglia do in normal life? What is getting wrong in the basal ganglia uh, when we are getting Parkinson's disease? So. The first part, uh, the normal basal ganglia and Parkinson's disease, I will start with our experiment in the monkey. Then I will move a little bit to our physiological recording in the human patient undergoing Dibran stimulation uh, in order to treat their advanced Parkinson's disease. And in the end, I will try to come back and to use uh, uh, this information that we are learning from the abnormal basal ganglia in order to say uh, what are the best methods for the future to treat a human patient with a advanced uh, disorder of the basal ganglia. Uh, I, I apologize, I will try to finish in time, but as always when I'm coming to speak in front of Stan, I'm trying to, sh uh, Jeanette and Gilly, all my friends, I'm trying to show them that we are working from time to time, so <laughs> I, I'll try to do it in time. Uh, usually when we are speaking about, uh, 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 about the agent that is living in the world, we can, uh, and the agent can be you, can be your dog, and can be uh, your computer or robot that will send outside, we can make a long story short by saying that uh, the agent is making an action on the world. As for example, I'm, I'm now, for me, it is I am the agent, you are the world, so I am speaking to you. And as a return, the world is changing, and I am the agent, as I am getting the new state and the reward. And uh, this reward can be positive if I see that you are happy, and can be negative if I see that you are really bored. And uh, uh, the bottom line is that, uh, to, uh, we would summarize this, that uh, the goal of the uh, agent is to optimize the behavioral policy, that is the mapping between the state and the action, such to maximize the cumulative reward that you will get from the environment. Okay? Okay, so we are tr looking for a behavioral policy that is mapping between current state and action that will maximize the cumulative reward. And again, reward can be either positive if you are happy or negative if you get punishment. Okay, and therefore uh, you are trying to maximize your pleasure. And, uh, and, the, and the, the major problem is that uh, uh, finding this uh, optimal behavioral pol uh, policy is at least 
uh, probably you know from yourself, uh, uh, it, it is not an easy problem, okay? Uh, there is no, no old teacher that tell us what we should do, okay? What is the, the best behavioral policy, okay? Uh, the world the environment is changing, the rules are changing from time to time, and even if we know the rules, they are noisy, okay? So it is not fixed rule that we have to deal with them. And finally, the feedback that we are getting from the environment is not instructive, okay? So not, again, this is coming back to the teacher that is not no all teacher, and nobody tell us, go to Stockholm or go to Jerusalem, Okay, you see, we are just getting feedback which is color, we are happy or not happy, and many times it is delayed, okay? So uh, now Janet know that she's done mistake in order in, in uh, inviting me to come here, but if she would like to go back to the origin, the decision to do, to da, to do it was done three, six months ago, okay? And therefore the feedback is delayed and it is not, uh, is not complete. So, uh, uh, this problem is not only for us, it's also in, in the field of uh, uh, machine learning. And uh, usually we say that, uh, to make a long story short, uh, we are having today's solution for this common problem. And the, f the first solution is that we should find a trade-off between exploitation and exploration, okay? So we should not all the time exploit everything that we've done, because it could be that real good neuroscience is done in Jerusalem and not in Europe, okay? So if you'll never explore Jerusalem, you'll never find if there is a good neuroscience over there, okay? And on the other side, we cannot explore all the time, okay? Because this is too risky. So the big, the big question that we looking for optimal behavioral policy without a teacher that will tell us that know everything and will tell us what is the, the optimal behavioral policy is to find the optimal trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And the way that we can do it is by dividing our agent into two parts. Okay, so this is the agent that we've done over here, and we can divide it to two parts. One is one part is the actor, and the actor is a very very simple part of the agent. This is where the the mapping between the current state and the action is done. Okay, so this is the the actor part of it. it could be deterministic mapping, it could be probabilistic mapping. We'll come to come to some kind of mapping that we are doing between state and action, but this is what is done in, in, in the actor. But then actually we have the critic or the teacher of the system. And what this critic is calculating all the time is the mismatch between prediction and reality. So you don't have a priori knowledge or you have a limited a priori knowledge, okay? So let's say that you don't have any a priori knowledge, so you start with prediction 50-50%. It is going to be a good seminar or a bad seminar, 50-50, okay? And then two minutes later, you are telling it to yourself this is going to be a bad seminar, okay? So reality is worse than your prediction, okay? Next time you will not come and so on, so on, so on, okay? So all the time, okay, you, all the time, and this is done on continuous temporal manner, you compare your prediction to reality, okay? And using this, the temporal difference error, okay, that calculate the prediction, the, the mismatch between your prediction and reality, you change your behavioral policy, okay? For example, if reality is better than your prediction, you reinforce the doing that you've done up to now, or if it is negative, you don't do it, and you, of course, you update your kind of prediction, okay? So this is the way that we can overcome, okay? Achieve in automatic way this goal of optimizing behavioral policy in spite of all this fact that we don't have, that the, the feedback that we are getting from the environment is incomplete and non-instructive and the environment is changing and noisy. So th this is the solution in the, uh, in, in the machine learning uh, field, but eventually we can now look and see that this was not invented by uh, by the, by the people from computer science, it was invented by biology before.
And uh, uh, if we are looking at this agent, we can replace it with the loop of the basal ganglia network. Okay, so now this is the agent. This is all cortical area encoding your current state. So this is your uh, uh, auditory system encoding the voice that you hear now. It is your vision system encoding the vision that uh, you are looking. It is your frontal cortex or hippo uh, uh, hippocampus encoding your memory, encoding your motivation. The current state, your current state is encoded in over here all in uh, this uh, uh, part of the, uh, all part of the cortex. Then we go through the basal ganglia starting in the inter Input stage of the basal ganglia, the subthalamic nucleus and the striatum, and we'll come to it, going to the external segment of the globus spidus, output structure of the basal ganglia, and then from the output structure of the basal ganglia, we are going up to the motor center of the brain, either in the frontal cortex or in the, in the brain stem. So eventually we have this loop of action that is coming from the motor center of the brain and the world, the, 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 the world is changing and the state and reward are giving back to the cortex. So this is the main axis or the actor of the basal ganglia network. And you can see that from my point of view, the basal ganglia network is all the, is all the brain almost, okay? So all cortical area, including amygdala and the hippocampus are projecting to the basal ganglia. And uh, therefore, this is most part of, of the brain, brain that I'm putting in the basal ganglia network. I'm putting them in the basal ganglia network because there is another part that it is mainly in the basal ganglia, and this is the neuromodulator or the critic. And the neuromodulator, it is clearly the dopamine, but also the serotonin and the cholinergic interneuron of the, that, that are strongly located here in the, in, inside the, the striatum. And from our point of view, these are the critic or the teacher of the basal ganglia. And therefore we see that uh, to make a long story so short, we have the, exactly the same, the same uh, architecture as we have over here. A critic actor, we have the basal ganglia main axis, and we have the basal ganglia neuromodulator who are the critic that enable us to find the optimal behavioral policy. So this is what we are having in mind about uh, the model and the question is of course can we support this thing by a uh, physiological finding. So the way that we have done it, we are uh, recording uh, uh, electrophysiological activity, mainly spikes, but also local field potential from uh, behaving monkeys. Uh, the task is uh, quite simple now in this day for us. It is, we have cues, fractal cues that are different from monkey to monkey and so on and so on. One of the fractal cues predict uh, food for the monkey that the monkey like. The other fractal cue predict air puff to the eyes that the monkey don't like. And, uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, for in this case, this fractal cue predict the neutral outcome. Okay, so no, no food and uh, no, no air puff. And clearly the monkey, uh, uh, and these cues are given for two seconds and then the outcome is coming and then intertrial interval, long intertrial interval. And you can see that the monkey clearly understand the meaning of the cue. So for this is for example, example when we give the, the cues that predict reward, you see that the monkey start leaking even during the time of the cue, and then when the, when the food was coming, the monkey was leaking a lot. And when we give the cues that predict aversive outcome, air puff, you see that the monkey has a, 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 b the monkey blink even before we get, uh, even before the air, the air puff is coming and uh, avoid the, the, the air puff to the eye. And we, uh, when we give the neutral cue, mm, the monkey neither leak, neither blink. So the monkey, it is very easy for the monkey to learn this task. And uh, uh, what we've done over the, the last several years that we played with this task and, and modulate it. So for example, in one set of experiment, we changed the probability of the outcome. 
okay? So we gave different cues that tell the monkey the probability that you'll get food is one, two third or third, and, and so on for, for the other cue. In one other, uh, in another set, to we'll change the, uh, the outcome intensity. By the way, this is the human primate and this is the non-human primate that participate in, uh, in, in the study. Uh, so in one set, to we'll change the outcome intensity, that is the, how much food or what is the intensity of the, uh, of the air puff. And in, in another set that we are now doing, uh, we change the outcome delay. That is, uh, if the, the outcome will arrive immediately after the queue or, or later. And uh, uh, the recording method is uh, quite simple. Uh, let's put it this way. What we do is that we are putting uh, eight microelectrodes that we can manipulate each one of them uh, sep separately in order to, to find uh, uh, as many as possible neuron in our recording target. Uh, we, have, we are quantifying the isolation quality, so we are very proud that we are not saying only it is well isolated cell, but we, we have uh, objective uh, quantification of the isolation quality, and our database is is composed of uh, units that we can give you the number. This is only unit with isolation quality bigger than, usually bigger than 0.8 on a scale of 0 to 1. So uh, the, the good unit, but you don't have to trust us. You can go back to, to the original data. And uh, this is, for example, an uh, example of uh, six electrode recording uh, of tonically active neuron in the striatum that usually fire something like five uh, uh, to 10 spikes per second. Uh, this is an example of eight electrode in the uh, external segment of the globus pallidus, much faster area with, so each line is the original spike that uh, we are seeing in this area. And this you may see it is uh, a much uh, higher frequency, 50 to 60 uh, spike per second. And again, the target of the recording, so we've done all the record, and we verify using MRI, and again, details that you can find in the, in the paper that we publish. And the, the major idea is that we have, again, the same task. So one trial that was given in every, every monkey, Okay, and we recorded the activity in the, of the dopaminergic neuron, of the uh, tonically active uh, neuron or the cholinergic interneuron in, of the striatum in the posterior putamen, GPE, external segment, GPI, internal segment of the globus pidus, substantia nigra reticulata in this monkey. Over here we recorded the activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, uh, anterior putamen caudate ventral striatum of medium spiny, tonically active neuron, and fast spiking interneuron, and GPE, so we always have GPE because GPE is so nice. Uh, so we, uh, for us, we record all the time GPE, and uh, our assumption that if the GPE is the same, then we can merge everything else in the data. And now we are recording from the subthalamic nucleus and the uh, GPE and striatum uh, in, in, the, in the current project. And, uh, and then we look at the activity of neuron and, uh, and, uh, and the bottom line is that let's start looking at this discrimination of critical teacher and main, main axis. So we recorded the activity of the teacher and the teacher in our end are the dopaminergic neuron in the substantia nigra pars compacta or the cholinergic interneuron in the striatum, the tonically active neuron. And over here you see the average PSTH, this time to the Q, so this is 0.8 second, and you see the response of the dopaminergic neuron to the cue that predict reward, to the cue that predict uh, uh, air puff in red, and in green, to the cue that predict a uh, uh, neutral outcome. And you may see that this is uh, almost similar to as predicted. The dopaminergic neuron encode better the uh, future uh, rewarding event than the re uh, aversive event. Uh, when the, the outcome arrived, okay, when the monkey got the 
reward, the actual reward, there was much bigger response, and then, the, and then there was, but there was also response to the aversive event. But you see over here that when this was the probabilistic task, so when we tell the monkey there is a probability of one third or two thirds that you will get reward or air puff, in one third or two thirds of the cases, the reward of the air puff were omitted. Okay, and you see that, so you see over here the response of the dopaminergic neuron to the case that air puff was omitted in red, to the case that reward was omitted in blue, and to the, uh, to the neutral outcome. So again, nothing happened. And you may see that dopaminergic neuron do not encode the reward or the air puff omission. Okay, so they do not encode, uh, they, they are having very, very similar, again, this is the average of 100 dopaminergic neuron, so the, there is no encoding over here, okay? So you may say, you may say, oh, this is not a good teacher, okay? A good teacher should tell me if uh, re reward, a positive outcome was omitted or aversive outcome was omitted, okay? And what you may see over here is that uh, uh, luckily enough, the basal ganglia have more than one teacher, okay? And if we are looking at the other teacher, the cholinergic teacher, and again, coming to the classical basal ganglia literature with dopaminergic cholinergic balance, okay? So the cholinergic teacher is clearly playing a major role in the basal ganglia circuity. You see that over here, when the Q was coming, the cholinergic teacher was very inefficient, okay? It, in our end, okay? So the holi, you see the red, the blue, and the green are, uh, curves are completely over, uh, overlapping, telling us that the cholinergic interneuron don't discriminate between the cues that predict outcome or a, a predict positive outcome or negative outcome, unlike the dopaminergic. But when we are looking for, when we are going to the outcome, you see the response of the cholinergic interneuron for, for the actual air puff and for the reward, but look over here for the omission, okay? So the, the, the cholinergic interneuron, this is for the neutral outcome in, 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 in green, this is for the omission of the air puff in red, and this is for the omission of the reward. So uh, the, the clear take home message is that if we are looking at the uh, outcome omission, the TANS are doing much better than the dopaminergic neuron. If you are looking over here, the dopaminergic teacher is doing much better than the cholinergic teacher. So luckily enough, we don't have only one teacher in, in the basal ganglia with uh, other teacher. Uh, most of you that know the basal ganglia literature should be surprised, okay? Because most of you probably are very aware of this uh, classical uh, description of dopaminergic neuron by Wolfram Schultz, okay? That tell us that dopaminergic neuron encode a, 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 a positive outcome, they encode the a prediction of this positive outcome. So if we train the monkey that this condition is stimuli predict reward, you get a very strong uh, uh, response over here. And they encode the omission of uh, the positive outcome by depression of their uh, activity. So this is the classical uh, uh, description of Wolfram Schultz that everybody is very, very happy because they tell us that dopaminergic neuron encode both the positive and the negative uh, mismatch. And clearly, in our end, we don't see it, okay? So you don't see this very nice uh, decrease of activity when we omitted the uh, food outcome, okay? You see, it is the same, we are getting very, very similar response when we, do, we omit the reward outcome and the air puff outcome. And this is actually going over here, okay? So we tell the monkey, you are going to get food or air puff to the eye, okay? Clearly the monkey don't, don't like to the air puff to the eye. So, uh, looking at Schultz's uh, classical data, one would assume that when I tell the monkey that you are going to get air puff to the eye, there will be a decrease in the activity, okay? But what we've learned 
is that the response of the basal ganglia teacher is not dependent on the single trial, it's depending on the context, okay? And I would like to show you over here in our recording of the activity of the, uh, of the, of the cholinergic interneuron, okay? So this recording of the cholinergic interneuron was done uh, in the probabilistic task, okay? So you see it over here for the cue and for the outcome. Okay, so you see this and this over here uh, for the two monkeys that were engaged in the probabilistic task. But over here you see the response only to the Q is probability one, okay? So we pick up the only the, the trial that we gave exactly the same trials in the second uh, task with the dollar context. That is when we play with the intensity, but not with the probability. So you see the response of the cholinergic neuron to exactly the same task, but a different context. And you may see that now, okay, if you are looking at the response, it is it switch over, okay? The big response of the cholinergic interneuron is in the dollar context, in the intensity context, is now to the Q and not to the, and not to the outcome. So this mismatch between Wolfram Schuller result and our result over here in the dopaminergic and over here is a result of the complex teaching message that the basal ganglia neuromodulator are giving us, which is depend on many, many things. It is not only single trial, it's the context that uh, the monkey is living inside and it reflects many, many other things. So, we cannot only look on the, on the response to say what do these neurons are uh, encoding. And nevertheless, we have been interested to know if we, one can look at other aspects and to say, yes, these are critic, these are teacher, and these are a part of the main axis. So over here, we just look at the temporal pattern. So this is now for the two seconds of the queue. These are the very short response of the basal ganglia teacher. And indeed, as we expect from a teacher that encode the prediction error. Prediction error is a temporary, is a derivative, okay? Janet knew at the beginning that she was done mistake when she uh, invited me, but now, okay, this is over, okay? So now she is over here, okay? So th there is no, no any more error, okay? So this is for the, the, short, the, short, the, uh, the sharp response are okay for the neuromodulator, and you may see that when we are looking at the main axis of the basal ganglia, external segment of the globus pardus, internal segment, a substantia nigra articulata, we see very nice sustained response over a uh, two second. We see it also when we are looking at the other neuron in the main axis. So this is from the anterior cingulate cortex. This is the striatum in the striatum, that, uh, uh, medium, the medium spiny neuron. And this is again from another monkey in the external segment of the globus pallidus. Again, I don't have time to, to go into it, but uh, this was published. This sustained activity in the striatum is not that every neuron in the striatum has a long sustained activity, but we have different cluster, a, a neuron with very sharp response, with medium and very long response, but the, as overall we are getting this very nice sustained response. Also, when we are looking at the, GP, at, the, uh, at the globus pallidus, and now with the task that we have delay that lasts only for two seconds and delay that lasts for eight seconds, you see that the globus pallidus neuron encode the, all over the delay duration for eight seconds as we are waiting for neuron as part of the acti, act or part of the basal ganglia. And finally, we we'll look for another issue that we have predicted that will be different between the critic and the main axis of the basal ganglia. And here we look for the question how much the critic are synchronized. So we would like the teacher to be synchronized. You don't like one of your teacher tell you run away or run to the right and another teacher tell you run to the left, okay? You would like a teacher to give you the same message. 
The way that we can do it, to look for it, is by looking at the signal correlation. That is, we have the recording of more than one neuron, let's say of pair of neuron, and we have the vector of the response, and we can assess the correlation between the response vector of the two neuron. Okay? And if like over here, okay, you see it for the, the, for the basal ganglia teacher, the dopaminergic and the cholinergic interneuron. If you, the distribution of the correlation, the signal correlation is shifted to the right, okay, here and here, you may say that the teacher are synchronized, as you may see also in the, the spike to spike uh, cross correlation matrix. But if you are looking at the neuron at the main axis, okay, then you see that there is a very broad distribution of signal correlation and the average of the signal correlation is around zero and uh, not uh, shifted to the right as it is for the neuron over here. I, I don't have time to go to it. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, part of the old world that we've done uh, regarding temporal modulation of the synchronization. This is uh, just uh, is now in press in Journal of Neuroscience. But to say that the synchronization is much uh, bigger issue and uh, uh, we'll go to it sometime when I will have time to it. So coming, coming back to, uh, uh, to the model of the basal ganglia, that we start with this idea that the basal ganglia, we, we are having the, uh, the main axis of the basal ganglia and we are having the world. And in the, uh, I would say 10 years ago, we've been thinking only on, on one teacher of the basal ganglia. This is the dopamine teacher that encode the positive or the negative uh, prediction of pleasure. But uh, today we would like to believe that we are having more than one axis of our emotion, okay? It is not that it is only pleasure that can be positive or negative. This is, uh, uh, with a smile I'm saying, this is good for the American, but we are trying to be European and a little bit more complex, okay? So let, let, let's, say, let's say that we, we have two axes, okay? And these two axes, but again, two axes is one too many, okay? So I'm not claiming that it is exactly two axes. And we are having the cost and the gain, and they are not the same, okay? So cost is not minus gain, okay? And we are trying to optimize our behavior. That is, we are trying to minimize the cost and to maximize the gain. And again, knowing from uh, uh, economics, we know that there is the Pareto frontier, which is depending on the statistic of the environment. And clearly, if we are here, okay, we are paying this cost and get, get, getting only this gain, we should go up to the Pareto frontier, okay? So this is our optimal behavior is somewhere on this, okay? But where is the optimal behavior? This is open question, okay? This is not clear, and this is the issue of multi-objective optimization rather than single objective optimization as it was done in previous reinforcement learning model. And when, and again, the, the mathematics is over here, so everybody can go over it, but when we've done this kind of uh, multi-objective optimization uh, uh, for these two parameters, we found the solution that the probability of action is behaving as a soft max uh, function. And the idea with softmax, softmax action is the probability of action J is depending of the value of this uh, action J or what we are expecting to get, but also on the temperature, okay? And the temperature is, let's say, or the pseudo temperature in the gibbs donan uh, distribution. And, but, but this is exactly what you can think about it, okay? You go to South Italy, you have high temperature. You go to Milano, you have low temperature. You go to Sweden, you have minus temperature, okay? <laughs> and I'm speaking about the people. <laughs> so, <laughs> with a smile, okay? But, <laughs> but uh, 
But the point is that the temperature is telling us where we'd like to be on this Pareto frontier, okay? So let's say that we are now in Las Vegas, okay? We have high temperature, okay? So we don't care, okay? The probability of our action doesn't depend on the outcome because we just came to enjoy, okay? Okay, so this is, this is the softmax with very, very high temperature, okay? Then we, reduce the, then we reduce the temperature very, very strongly, okay? And we are getting to the situation that we can select only the greedy solution, okay? So we all the time will, will not explore, okay? Over here we are just doing exploration, okay? This is one extreme. This is the other extreme. We just exploit, okay? We don't, we take the greedy, we take the, uh, the uh, we do the, only the actions that will max, that we believe that will maximize uh, our outcome. And in the middle, in somewhere in the middle temperature, we'll get, of course, this is, this, this should be a kind of sigmoid, but the point is that this will be something which is like probability matching, okay? So we'll do more the, uh, the action that should probably lead to higher value, but from time to time we'll explore, okay? So our, our, our behavior is really a function of our temperature and you can modulate it according to the state, according to your need, according to the situation that you are corrected. It. But the point is that now with this single parameter or the softmax equation, we can really see the, uh, the diversity of our behavior from gambling to probability matching to a highly greedy solution. And when we are coming now to the basal ganglia, we can really have it now back to the basal ganglia. So from our point of view, the neuromodulator of the basal ganglia, the dopamine, the acetylcholine, the serotonin, do not only affect the uh, corticostriatal plasticity. They first affect the excitability of striatal neuron. And therefore, when you inject apomorphin to a Parkinsonian patient, you get this patient re-behaving in less than one minute, okay? So dopamine agonist, ultra-fast dopamine agonist, restore almost normal behavior in less than a minute, okay? So really, what we need is that we have uh, this neuromodulator of the basal ganglia acting not only on the efficacy of the synapse between the cortex on, and the striatum, they are uh, working on the pseudo temperature, which is in, now, this is the uh, excitability of the striatal neuron. But clearly, they are also working on the striatal excitability and they are having this state to action uh, uh, association. And looking, for example, on the difference between dopamine and 5-HT. So, dopamine encode positive mismatch, okay? You enter to the, room, to the room and you got chocolate, okay? So you increase the temperature because you would like to take the chocolate, okay? And also you increase the uh, efficacy of this connection so next time you will enter the room. 5-HT, you enter a room and there was a lion in the room, okay? You run away, you need to increase the temperature, you don't like to freeze, you have to run away, okay? So even if it is a prediction of aversive event, you need to increase the temperature, okay? But next time, better not enter to this room, okay? So this is the mapping of this uh, uh, multi-objective optimization top-down model into the basal ganglia circuit. And uh, again, we can speak a lot about it and still open, and uh, we call it uh, the reinforcement-driven multi-objective optimization, okay? And there are many, many open questions, okay? First of all, there are too many open parameters. It, it is not, it, it is not uh, that this is the only solution, but uh, we believe that life are more complicated than one axis, and therefore we should go into, uh, into this model. So I, I'm done with the first part of, of my talk, okay? And I would like to go now to the second part and I, I, I apologize because I have to switch gear and I have now to move to second, third, uh, third gear. But, but the point is that 
for us, it is interesting and it is important to understand the basal ganglia because in many, many uh, types of human disease, we are getting depletion or a malfunction of the critic of the basal ganglia. And we believe that this, for example, this depletion of dopamine in the Parkinson, in Parkinson disease is leading to malfunction of the neural activity in the main axis of the, of the basal ganglia. So what are the changes that we can see in the basal ganglia? Clearly we can see changes in the firing rate, a decrease in the firing rate of the external segment of the globus pallidus, increase in the subthalamic nucleus and the GPI, and therefore we inactivate the subthalamic nucleus or the GPI in order to cure Parkinson's disease, so this is old story. We see oscillations that appear in the, in the main axis of the basal ganglia. We see huge amount of synchronization, okay? So this is seven electrode recording and you see a very strong, very long effect to second of synchronized activity. And finally, we can see synchronous oscillation, okay? So this is two and three, okay? So this is the flat cross-correlation matrix in the normal monkey. These are the autocorrelation and this is the autocorrelation in the MPTP monkey after dopamine depletion, MPTP monkeys that we gave him the neurotoxin MPTP is Parkinsonian now. So these are the autocorrelation. You see the oscillatory activity over here and these are the cross correlation. So synchronous oscillation. So this is in the monkey, but we can also look at the human patient. And uh, we are lucky in, uh, in having a, a, a very active program for uh, uh, different stimulation in, in our center. And uh, uh, when we uh, put our electrode, uh, trying to locate mainly the subthalamic nucleus for human patient with Parkinson disease, we are doing electrophysiological recording in order to define the border to say, to tell us what is the, uh, the optimal place uh, to look for, uh, uh, to put our electrode. And when we are uh, uh, looking at the activity that we can find in the subthalamic nucleus, so this is uh, three neurons, so we are getting very nice recording. Of course, these are best typical example, but uh, uh, nevertheless, okay, uh, uh, we are getting very nice recording. This is three seconds. So you may see that this is uh, over here, you are having one, two, three, four, five. So this is five hertz. And when we are looking at the power spectrum, you see over here, this is a peak at five hertz. This is at about 10, and this is at the better range, uh, 20 to 30, 30 hertz. What we can do, what we are doing in the operating room, is that we are looking at the spectrogram, okay? So we are usually starting uh, when we are going to the subthalamic nucleus. So these are different five patients that I randomly collected uh, a few days ago. Okay, so we start 10 millimeter above where the subthalamic, should, subthalamic nucleus should be. We are going all the way in the internal capsule, then we are entered to the subthalamic nucleus, and we can look at the spectrogram. So over here it is again the distance, 10 to minus two in these cases. This is the frequency, three to 100, and over here in red, it telling us that we did see a lot of uh, oscillation in the tremor range. This is more common, we see in the beta range for this patient over here, and uh, these are different subthalamic. This is a patient who is both beta and tremor frequency. So this is all from the subthalamic nucleus. This is from the globus pallidus, GPE, GPI, GPUC oscillation, mainly in the GPI in, in, in our trajectory. I, I, I'll not speak about the GPE, GPI, I'll speak only about the subthalamic nucleus. So to make a long story short, when we calculate something like more over than 300 penetration into the subthalamic nucleus, and we put, we normalize it, but the points that we enter to the subthalamic nucleus, the points that we have been outside of the subthalamic nucleus, subthalamic nucleus is somewhere between, let's say, four to seven millimeter in our end, so we just normalized for uh, all over the patient. So this is distance in the subthalamic nucleus, and this is again frequency, three to 100, and red mean high energy. You see that in the dorsal lateral, because we are coming this way, in the dorsolateral part of the subthalamic nucleus, there are tremor frequency oscillation and beta, but not in the 
uh, not in the ventral medial part of the subthalamic nucleus. And this is mean third derivation, median uh, mud, but we don't care now too much. And, and the point that we ask ourselves is if this gradual decline is what we see in every patient or it is result of different span of the oscillatory area in different patient. And the bottom line was that no, it is in some patient we see very short uh, oscillatory region, in some patient is medium, in some patient is, is longer, and we have done automatic system using the hidden Markov model that detect it, so we are getting it now in real time, so we can see that in each patient we can divide the subthalamic nucleus into the dorsolateral oscillatory region and the ventromedial non-oscillatory region. And indeed we see now that if we are looking at the spectrum in the dorsolateral oscillatory region versus the spectrum in the ventral medial, they are completely different. This is the difference between them. And uh, if you are looking at the intensity of the oscillation, so we have a, a score for small, weak oscillatory activity, strong and even stronger oscillatory activity. So you may see that uh, when we are looking at really big number, uh, almost 4,000 recording from the subthalamic nucleus of our patient, you see that the, the score for strong oscillation in the dorsolateral are much bigger than in the ventromedial. And the most important issue is that this oscillation can tell us also about other things. So when we are putting our two electrodes in the oscillatory region, they are synchronized. So this is the coherence function, this is the intensity. So if the two electrodes are in the dorsolateral oscillatory region, we see a lot of coherent oscillation. But if one electrode is over there, one electrode is over here, there, the, the coherence is flat. And if the two electrodes are in the, in the ventral medial, it is still flat. The intensity is different, I will not go into it. Uh, we can show that the, that the synchronization is not an epiphenomena of the of oscillation at, the, the, at similar frequency by doing shuffling, and again I'll skip it. But the most important take home message is that we found that there is a correlation between the length of the dorsolateral oscillatory region in our surgery and the improvement that we are getting uh, 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 of the patient after surgery. So today, if we see such a recording in the operating room and conditioning allow, we'll try to find a better place to put our electrode, okay? So we, this tells us now that we are better looking for this signature in the human patient and not to, uh, uh, not to this signature. And finally, just to say that uh, uh, what is the different role, we believe that the dorsolateral oscillatory region is the motor part of the subthalamic nucleus, but the ventromedial, at least those on the right side, is the one which is related to the limbic part of the subthalamic nucleus. So we gave our patient emotional voice and ask them to recognize if this is a positive emotion or negative emotion. You see there is no response in the left or right uh, dorsolateral uh, oscillatory region and there is a very, very strong response to the emotional voice in the right uh, ventromedial subthalamic nucleus. The left, we believe, is for speech, but again, this is uh, still under reconstruction. So having done all this, okay, finding the bad guys okay, of Parkinson's disease, can we use it? And today, when we are doing deep brain stimulation surgery, the way that we are doing it, that we are putting the pacemaker in the patient chest, and the patient is coming every three, six months to the clinic. The neurologist is checking his neurological symptoms and adjusts the parameter of the stimulation in order to, to, uh, to obtain optimal uh, therapeutic effect. But doing it every six, three to six months, it does not make sense. It is like changing the, uh, the, the eating or the uh, cooling system over here only three to six months, okay? 
clearly neural activity is much more dynamic, clearly the symptoms are much more dynamic. So the way that we have done it, we say, okay, if the basal ganglia are clever enough to use machine learning tricks, okay, in order to find the optimal behavioral policy, let's see if we can do the same trick in order to cure the basal ganglia, okay? And we are, we've started by using a, co a closed loop. A, a, a closed loop uh, system that detect the abnormal oscillatory. So you see, this is recording for the monkey. This is what we call normal recording and over here, oscillation start, okay? So we can detect this oscillation and whenever there is oscillatory activity, we, we stimulate. And again, to make a long story short, there is are many, many, many story over there. It is that if you are looking at the amount of movement that the monkey was doing before any DBS, this is with standard DBS and this is with closed loop DBS. And these are many, many controls that we've done. And the most important is that we have shown over here that the Parkinsonian basal ganglia can be observed and can be controlled, okay? So now it is only a matter for if they have this characteristic of observability and controllability, we can now look for the optimal way in order to uh, give the therapeutic uh, to our patient. Uh, I will not go into the detail, but again, part of it and everything is in this neuron paper, we can show that uh, uh, again, one can speak who is the bad guy, okay? The change in the firing rate, the change in the oscillatory, act, the, in the firing pattern or the, uh, uh, or the synchronization. We can show that it is the synchronous oscillation that are the bad guys in, in one of the parameters of the uh, closed loop. So uh, uh, th this is my final, uh, uh, my, my, my final uh, slide. What I was trying uh, to tell you that we can look today the, at the basal ganglia uh, interaction uh, with the world as the uh, actor, uh, actor critic system. We believe that uh, uh, dopamine depletion and other uh, disease of the basal ganglia like schizophrenia, like depression, are caused by malfunction of the critic leading to a, a abnormal activity in the main axis. But the major take home message that we are trying to say that up to now we've been working, when we've tried to help our patient, we've been working on this uh, on this axis. We've tried dopamine replacement therapy, stem cell therapy, we've been working on this axis. I do believe that the future is going over here looking at the spiking activity in the main axis of the basal ganglia, doing closed loop, very delicate a, a manipulation of the spiking activity in the basal ganglia and getting optimal a, therapy for the different basal ganglia disorder, starting with Parkinson, but maybe in the far future, also the negative symptoms of schizophrenia that we believe that are related to this order of uh, this. And uh, I just uh, like to say that if you are interested to hear more about the basal ganglia, so next March, okay, uh, we'll have the International Basal Ganglia 11 meeting in Elat. The temperature in Elat in March is 25 degree and above, the sea is blue, as you may see all the time. There are five, five uh, days of rain all over the year, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, uh, clearly it is different. This is a lot, okay? This is the, the Red Sea, okay? And this is the Princess Hotel over the, you see, just over the sea. A lot is located over here to those of you. This is the Mediterranean. And uh, uh, I, I promise you a lot of dopamine spritz if you <laughs> will come to this meeting. Thank you very much. For